First of all, thank you very much to the conference uh, organizers. It's uh, truly an honor to be here. Uh, I'll speak uh, slightly different, as my uh, title suggests, to a slight, I guess, directly to the architectural audience and to the concerns which uh, seems to be prevalent in the architectural discussion today, uh, discussions about sustainability, what it means for practice, and what it means for uh, historians to interject and inform that sort of interaction. Uh, so let me just begin quickly. Uh, I want to talk about this exhibition, which recently appeared surprisingly at MoMA, uh, Sustainability at MoMA. It, it seems to be something uh, rather surprising, uh, but it seems to be pointing toward the tre uh, larger trend, I believe, which is informing the way we're looking at uh, globalization and cross-cultural exchanges at large. Uh, between October 3rd and 2010, uh, between Oct October 3rd, 2010 and January 3rd, 2011, the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, in New York had a small, uh, held a small exhibition, Small Scale, Big Change, in one of its side galleries. A small exhibition, keeping true to its name, produced a big impact, sending the show's curator and many of the 11 architects featured in it on the lecture circuit of the architecture schools around the world. As declared by the subtitle of the exhibition, which you can barely see up there, uh, this reception reflects the re-emerging belief in the power of architecture as a medium of court social engagement, especially when the goal is to carry out this engagement across diverse cultural and economic contexts. Architectural projects, it is proposed, when carried out with a critical eye of court sustainable local resources and court participatory engagement, motivates people to take their destiny in their own hands and provide the much needed opportunity for collective expression. Uh, images of happy children, content villagers, uh, and satisfied poor pervade the catalog as a testimony to this belief. What is not discussed in the exhibition catalog and the accompanying website, however, is that these images are also rife with certain censoring qualities which hide the complexity of the participatory discourse promised by such architectural interventions. This erasure can be strongest felt in the manner in which terms like village, community, tradition, and identity are repeatedly defined uh, in both the exhibition and the catalog uh, and the website. For Andreas Lepic, the show's curator at MoMA, these projects provide, quote, communities not only with physical spaces, but with the opportunities of self-determination and an enhanced sense of identity, end quote. In this description, the community is framed as a homogeneous and universally found entity, one that has a collective desire for self-determination and a collective sense of identity. The only thing preventing these communities from expressing and strengthening their collective identity is the lack of collective opportunity, such as, these, such as the one presented by these projects. Community, however, can also be a name for particular, can also be a name for particular histories of forced inclusion and exclusion, a name for political and gendered divisions, contestation and asymmetric power struggles. These historical dimensions of the term community are excluded to present it as a common ground on which a comparative global framework can be constructed, a comparative framework which makes, the, makes it possible to think of something called globalization as a commonly shared experience. I would like to argue that this dehistorization of community and tradition evident, evident in the MoMA exhibition is emblematic of a larger discourse of sustainable and self-help architecture emerging today. And, this is, and that this dehistoricization is highly problematic in cross-cultural exchanging focusing on the third world. For it assumes that community and tradition are spheres outside of modernity and global capitalist relations of power. From this view, the goal of architectural intervention is to bring domains hitherto, hitherto excluded from global and national modernization projects into their fold in an ethically informed manner. This would be all good and nice if we existed in a world where such pure traditional and communal domains existed. But what if the very concepts of tradition and community as ahistorical, ahistorical entities were shaped, invented, molded, first by different colonial powers and then by national governments to put in place extremely despotic and indirect systems of government? What if for us to describe them as outside of specific histories is to ensure the continuity of those systems of power? Take, for example, how the project of the school at Gando in Burkina Faso is described in the MoMA exhibition. And here I'm not criticizing the particular architects, but the discourse that is sustained uh, through their work. As this is how uh, the school or this project is described. 
A school fallen into disrepair in his childhood village in Burkina Faso forces an expat expatriate architect in Germany, Diebedo Francis Chiere, to contemplate the future of his native homeland. Encouraged by his classmates in Berlin, he brings to task his education, hard-earned through merit and scholarship. Chiere, the catalog tells us, hoped to use what he had learned in Germany about the ecological building techniques uh, to provide a model for future schools that were both sustainable and more suitable to local needs, end quote. For this transfer of knowledge, we are assured, Kire, quote, began a dialogue with the villagers, soliciting their input and ensuring that when time came, the community could, would help to construct the school uh, in various stages, end quote. The narrative seems transparent and ethically grounded. What could be wrong <coughs> with such a description? Who wouldn't appreciate a professionally informed, emotionally charged, selflessly driven effort to help a village community in need. An effort that most importantly involved an open dialogue with the villagers themselves. Yet there is something detrimental about this narrative. The narrative constructs a generalized periphery for the consumption of the Western audience by employing generalizing and homogenizing abstractions such as villagers and, com uh, and community. The only quality the villagers possess is a uniformly shared spirit of collective improvement. This spirit ties them to villages everywhere else in the third world. A particular idea of globalization is staged here in which diverse areas are readily accessible and comparable to each other. The story of the school in Burkina Faso is not presented to us as a description of a particular project crisscrossed with particular dynamics of power that we uh, crisscross with particular dynamics of power on various scales but as a general, quote, model for future schools that are both sustainable and suited for local, local needs elsewhere, end quote. Not only in Burkina Faso, but in Africa and rural areas across the world. This modeling will not work unless the idea of the village and the community is devoid of its historical specificity. In this regard, this approach follows a long history Follows, uh, this, in this regard, this approach follows a long history of previous development approaches such as the self-help program carried out by the US, uh, USAID and UN United Nations that more, more than constructing uniform building practices, constructed uniform profiles of dehistoricized third world subjects that could serve as a basis for constructing a global train of intervention. Anyone from the third world can come to the first to acquire technical knowledge. Consequently, the first world development experts can go anywhere as well. The only requirement for international in the post-war global world is technical <coughs> knowledge. But what about historical knowledge? In Africa, particularly the French and British colonial Africa, the village and community are terms that are rife with a long political and particular history of despotic <coughs> structures of power. In British Southeast and French Sub-Saharan Africa, the colonial authorities employed a far-reaching program of constructing a plethora of tribal identities that classified a heterogeneous population into distinct compartments. These compartments were controlled through appointed tribal chiefs that were given comprehensive judicial, penal, and legislative powers. The chief controlled the movement of all the population of the designated villages and provided labor on agricultural land, mines, or urban factories depending on the, upon the <coughs> season and need or needs of the colonial economy. This strategy, strategy not only saved colonial resources, but also made challenging this system highly difficult, for it was carried out in the name of preserving local tradition and native culture from contamination by European values. Those tribal classifications became entrenched over time and have continued to exist even after independence. They have now been transferred over to national politics are, and now are at the basis of continuing political conflict and strife. There is not a hint in the exhibition of this concept of the village and community as historically constructed, politically contested terrains rife with ethnic and gendered exclusions, despite the fact there, that there is now a concert, concerted effort in Af African academic and political circles to undo the national naturalization and dehistoricization of these concepts in Af African national politics and strengthen strength and the goal, with the goal to strengthen the state's capacity to sublate those identities in political negotiations. This historicization of the village and community is not, sorry, this dehistorization of the village and community is not limited to projects in Africa. Another notable, notable example is of the quote, handmade school in Rudra, uh, Rudrapur, a village in North Bangladesh, and quote, de designated by the Austrian, designed by the Austrian architect Anna Herringer. A school made out of mud and bamboo 
uh, following quote, local traditional building practices has been presented in various forums and has won the coveted Al Khan Award in 2007. World Bank statistics are heavily cited around the project to give us a picture of local poverty and how efforts such as these carried out with limited means provide opportunities for participation and self-improvement. The part of the same statistics that is not quoted, however, is that 52% of the Bangladesh rural population is landless or has less than 0.5 acres of land. At a very crude level, this most likely already excludes more than half the population of the village from sending their children to, the, to this very school. This hierarchy is further divided by exclusion across gender, race, caste, class, and language. This, for, for example, only 3% of land is tenured in woman's name, woman's name. Less than 10% of women have their names even mentioned in any legal documents pertaining to property. <coughs> These statistics, like any statistics, are of course applicable to those women for whom property is even a concern. For millions more that work for and around those who are related to property in some way, their exploitation cannot even be recognized by statistics and measure, statistics measured in terms of systems of right and property. It is, e it is easy to call these divisions and subdivisions and, as remnants of tradition, a problem of Bengali tradition or Bengali nationalism. Yet there is nothing premodern or natural about these divisions. Tradition, if that's the word we choose to use for this condition, is a result of careful manipulation of legislation over the centuries of colonial, national, and now international and non-governmental rule. It was the Permanent Settlement Act of 1793 that divided the land in Bangladesh into a hierarchical system of zamindar at Patnedars for ta expedient tax collection, erasing the codes of land rights and usages that had existed previously. That system continued under national independence, first as eastern part of Pakistan, and then after 1971, under the independent government of Bangladesh. For, more, for many in the 52% of that landless population, independence was not a new beginning, but a displacement, a continuation of previous systems of oppression, now on new registers. In the narrative constructed by the exhibition, this complexity and, this, and its historical construction and continuation can have no place. The village community is presented as a homogeneous, a historical, non-political mass that benefits collectively from the presence of the school that serves as a model for community improvement across the country and, by extension, across the third world. Now, one can say that that's all architecture can do in the face of larger systemic inequalities, especially those inequalities whose legacy reaches back to colonialism. The architect and curator in this example argue that projects like these are, quote, architectural uh, acupuncture, relieving pain and providing some relief while we figure out the nature of larger ailment. Projects of this scale, we are told, never claim to solve the land distribution problem. They simply claim that we, could do, we should do something now, allow the people to improve their condition as much as they can, instead of waiting for those larger in inequalities to be addressed. Yet this view doesn't take into account that the way these small-scale projects, these stopgap solutions, frame the idea of community and tradition actually ensures the perpetuation of those long-term systematic inequalities. To assume that architecture ends with the building of the school is to ignore the now established history of modern architecture as media. The school building in Bangladesh is only a sign in the long chain of discursive entanglements <coughs> which frame our understanding of issues such as global poverty and development. The exhibition catalog, the talks given by architects, the image of schools shown in schools of architecture around the world shape that discourse. This is also architecture. What values are shaped in this larger arena of words and images are just as much the purview of architecture as the actual building on that site in Bangladesh. Our access to the project is shaped by its images and what we say about them. If we see in these images a narrative of entry into modernity of a unified pre-modern community, then how that community has been historically shaped as part and parcel of exploitative processes of global modernization is erased from view and understanding. Why in cross-cultural contexts, architecture more than not presents to us homogenizing images, images that erase complexity, erase hierarchies of power, erase political and gender divisions, erase divisions within gender and across gender. Why can't the museum catalog and an architect who has spent a considerable time in this village, supposedly, see that village not as a site of unity in diversity, but to use another well-known phrase, exploitation in unity, 
meaning hidden exploitation under images of global unity. Architecture as an image of unified communities ensures that exploitation is erased from view and continues on new registers for the benefit of new actors. We must ask ourselves why the primary requirement to go build a school in Bangladesh is to know the techniques of mud and passive solar construction. Why is the history of complex intertwined divisions which have excluded 52% of the population from any meaningful participation in colonial, national, and NGO-driven development not a, requirement to, not a requirement for claiming to act in that context? Why is knowledge of history, of political history, considered the purview of other disciplines? If you are going to go help the underprivileged, then it is our responsibility to learn the complexity of the context in which we are to operate. Otherwise, it doesn't matter what kind of buildings we produce. Architecture as a homogenizing image without a careful attention to the complexity of history turns into a bludgeon, flattening the persistent inequalities of global capitalist exploitation into simple caricatures of poor that fit neatly into project goals and funding criteria of global institutions and NGOs undermining the capacity of the state institutions themselves to raise those issues. If sustainability in architecture is to be more than an instrument of rendering this system invisible, then architects, both historians and designers, have to raise the level of minimum requirement of intervention in the decolonized context. For ourselves and for our students. Right now, besides being a professional, this requirement seems to be limited to acquiring technical knowledge of construction and local materials, some general and historically inaccurate impressions of local culture, and buying a plane ticket. Why isn't learning the local language in its intimate details part of this requirement? And by learning the local language, I mean beyond hellos and goodbyes and basic sen sentence structure. By learning, I mean learning the language to the extent that it becomes our intimate language, a language in which we can discern rhetoric rhetorical nuances of class, race, and gendered exclusions, and learn the complexity of the political histories that traverse the lives of those we intend to help. This would certainly be a requirement for someone coming from the decolonized world to the US or Europe with the intent of helping the disenfranchised, be they in the inner cities or rural areas. Why should intervention in the third world be quick and easy? Based on the knowledge we already possess, grounded in the belief that, that tested models of help in the first world can be readily transferred over to the rest of the world without the hard work of understanding those historical domains in their complexity and specificity. Why should we be able to one year propose a project in South Asia and the next in Africa? These questions haunt the idea of sustainability in architecture as it is being proposed through venues such as MoMA and elsewhere today. Thank you.